All good? All good. All good. Um, hello and uh, welcome to this virtual event with Liverpool Irish Centre and Rory McKernan in partnership with Chelsea Green Publishing. We're um, super excited to have Rory here. He's a wonderful guy, he's super cool. And we're going to be having a very informal chat and a Q&A after that, um, after Rory's reading from his book. Um, but first, I'd like to welcome all of our members who have taken time out of their evening to be here. It's great to see our community interacting with our virtual events. And it's been important for us to stay relevant and active during the second lockdown as well. And for those who are in this meeting now or who see this on Facebook or, or wherever who, who don't know what Liverpool Irish Centre is, um, we are the home of Liverpool's Irish community but we also wel we welcome anybody to the centre. And in the days before COVID, we would have had a fully packed timetable with lunch clubs, pensioners dinners, Irish dancing, Irish language, you know, music classes, flute bands, fitness clubs, a full bar, parties, events, and an Irish shop. Um, and the places were really versatile in the Irish centre, which is, which is fantastic. And it's really helped us through coronavirus as well. Um, we're stocking more Irish produce in our shop than, than anywhere in Liverpool, which is fantastic. We've jumped over all the hurdles that the government have laid out for our bar and our activities. And we just keep fighting for our community to stay open regardless of, of, of what's happening outside. Um, because it's important for people to feel at home in our centre. So if you want any more information about Liverpool Irish Centre, go to our website, um, email us at info at liverpoolirishcentre.org or find us on Facebook. Twitter or Instagram and um, with that thanks so much for coming and um, really super excited to see everybody here and super excited to hear from Rory and um, with that I'll hand you over to Rory and we'll learn all about his bestseller. He's in the thanks lovely, very much Niall. In the lovely west coast of Ireland he is. Thanks so much Niall, fair play. I appreciate the, the kind introduction and thanks for um, to you and everyone at Liverpool Irish Centre for hosting tonight and um, just before we get started I just want to check and um, my sound is okay the mic and stuff like that is you can hear me loud and clear and um, yeah and um, welcome to everybody joining on zoom you're more than welcome to turn on your cameras if you feel so inclined and if you prefer not to that's all cool as well and welcome to everyone joining on Facebook live as well and uh, we welcome your comments and um, I was going to say your your con queries and concerns, but I can't. I don't know if I can help you with your concerns, um, but we'll try our best. And um, so we've just got a, less than an hour together, and the plan is uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about the book, and I'll do a bit of reading from the book, and then we'll open it up into a Q and A and conversation. And it would be lovely. It's lovely for me to hear your thoughts and perspectives and curiosities, and. Um, for me, I love doing these events and, um, you know, obviously I'd love to be in the Liverpool Irish Centre right now. That would be cool. I think maybe most of us would agree, but I also feel it's an amazing opportunity and an amazing privilege that we can do things like this. You know, it's not something that I, I take for granted. So um, I really want to say I admire um, the likes of Liverpool Irish Centre and groups all over the world like them that are really rallying and as Niall said, like he used the term fighting for his community. And I think that's what we have to do right now. You know, we're fighting for each other, for ourselves. And in many ways, the book speaks to those themes that we have to stick together. First of all, we need to fight for ourselves, you know, to stay sane and stay well. Um, but I think these things are made easier when we can gather like this and, and share some stories and maybe look at hope and inspiration and how we might get out of these times together and hopefully reunite and um, hopefully not too distant future in Liverpool Irish Centre and we get some live music on and a bit of a party. Is anyone up for that? <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> um, so that would be cool because uh, it's all nice doing live stream events and Zoom and Facebook, but you know, nothing beats getting into a room with a with people so I, I really grateful to everyone for making the time this evening and I'd love to know where you're dialing in from I know there's lots of people in Liverpool and Merseyside in general and um, if you're I think there was a couple of people in the US and Ireland registered as well so I'd love to know in the comments section 
uh, where you're dialing in from, it'd be brilliant. And um, so I'm going to um, get started and just tell you a little bit about me for anyone that doesn't know me. Um, my name is Rory McKiernan. I'm originally from a small town called Coot Hill in County Cavan, which is just about 20 miles south of the border. Uh, so I grew up in that area and um, I suppose community was a big part of my life, uh, as it was in most places and still is in rural Ireland. And I now live in a place called La Hinch, which is a very small seaside village in the west of Ireland uh, on the so-called Wild Atlantic Way. Uh, it's a beautiful, stunning part of the world. And um, yeah, what else to say? I suppose growing up, hitchhiking was also a big part of my life. And uh, I'll talk about that in a minute because the book is very much about hitchhiking. It's about community, it's about kindness and resilience. So those are the big themes that are passionate to me. And for the last 20 years, I've worked in the community sector, community and voluntary, worked with charities, worked with campaign groups. Um, I founded a national youth organization here called Spun Out, uh, worked with great people to set that up. And I've also been involved in co-founding and founding other projects and campaigns and organizations. So um, I'm very passionate ultimately about people power. And when I say people power, um, I do mean social and political power, but not from a, I'm not necessarily talking about from a political party or ideology perspective. I'm just talking about people's voices getting heard and having a platform and having their rights. Um, but I'm also talking about um, power from a mental health or even what you might even call a spiritual health perspective, where we each have the power to know who we are, to uh, have dreams, uh, to follow our dreams and to stay well. You know, because um, I've noticed over the years and, and I've had been part of my own journey that that mental health can be a real challenge. And I, I see that it's it's just innately part of life, you know, the concept of adversity, of, of suffering, of challenges. And we're particularly in that now as a people, what, whatever country you're in or whatever community, there's barely a person that isn't affected right now by loneliness or separation, isolation, disconnection. Uh, but some more so than others, you know, I'm thinking of our older people, I'm thinking of people with disabilities, I'm thinking of uh, asylum seekers, I'm thinking of anyone that maybe is on the margins of society or has been forced to the margins of society. And so I, they're in my mind right now, you know, they're, they're people that um, I, I want to champion um, because often they don't get a platform or the rights. And a lot of time, I suppose, going back to the book, I, I can ramble and rant a lot about this, so forgive me, but the book is very much, it is my story, but it's a it's hundred other people in the book and their stories. So the book has its origins um, in the collapse of the Celtic tiger, which to those that maybe aren't aware, was uh, an economic and social cultural phenomenon where the Irish economy grew at a massive rate, the fastest rate in Europe over 10 to 15 year period, mostly in the 90s and noughties. And then it collapsed spectacularly. So there was a lot of positive change in that period, but also a lot of negative change. Life got busier, more stressful. Um, a lot of people got into a lot of debt. And when things crashed, things got very difficult for a lot of people. And so there was a time of, um, it was a time of great questioning and a time where we as a country wanted to kind of gather ourselves and have a think about what the future might hold for us. Um, and that paralleled a little bit in my life. I'd been involved in um, setting up this charity and I'd been working night and day. And truth be told, you could say that I was possibly a workaholic um, or just like many people working in the charity sector, um, you're just never done, you know, Niall will know this, like, I think Niall's supposed to be on his week off this week, and here he is, you know. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, I was supposed to be on a, a week off, so. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Um, <laughs> so, on the one hand, you're a hero, and on the other hand, you're, you know, you need a break, and you deserve a break as well. Um, but, you know, I didn't take those breaks, and um, that led to burnout, and burnout is very common in, in the modern world, in, in all professions, but particularly those that are under-resourced, you know. But, but I think maybe people dialing in will identify with that, just the, the pressures and the busyness of life. And it's not easy keeping all the bills paid and family and education and work, keeping all the, the wheels spinning. And um, so I got burnt out and it led to a kind of a dark and a sad and a lost time in my life. I decided to leave the charity that I founded behind and I just walked into the unknown. And 
it was around that period that I just didn't know what to do. I, I was thinking about emigration and I, I, three to 400,000 people emigrated in that period. Um, and they were mainly younger people, you know, so emigration is, you know, we think of it from a historical perspective in Irish culture, but this is only, we're only talking in the last number of years, uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of Irish people leaving. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, sorry, somebody's uh, mic is on. I'm just going to check that. Um, sorry about that. Maybe. Okay. Um, so. Okay, I got it. So I'm thinking of um, Liverpool Irish Centre, and when we look at Irish history, um, Liverpool is so such a core part of the Irish journey. I'm thinking of 1913 lockout and James Larkin and the thousands of Irish people that ended up in Liverpool seeking refuge and sanctuary. And then also prior to that, the famine ships that went to Liverpool. So Liverpool has been such an Irish city over the years. And I think it's good to keep that memory alive. And I also think it's good to draw the parallels um, between migration in the world today that when people are destitute or suffering and needing sanctuary and refuge. For me personally, I do wonder, you know, what does it mean to be an Irish person to remember and honor our history and then to maybe offer some of that understanding and compassion to people that may be fleeing Palestine or Syria or wherever it may be. I know these are very complex issues and often contentious, but if we can agree on one thing, I'd, I'd like it to be compassion and kindness and understanding. Um, so back to the hitchhiking. Um, I set out on this journey rather than, than heading off emigrating. Um, the next best thing to do was go hitching around Ireland. It's not necessarily the most obvious thing to do, but I suppose I wanted an adventure and I wanted answers as to where hope might come from for me and also for Ireland, I suppose. So the idea of hitchhiking came to me from thinking about how would I meaningfully and honestly connect with people? How would I just randomly bump into people and hear their stories? And it just felt like a really raw and loose and experimental way, I suppose, and, and a bit mad, you know? Um, I hadn't hitchhiked in maybe 20 years or something, so I didn't know if it was a thing. People told me it might not work, but I grew up hitchhiking. I knew it was a really, I knew that I had a lot of positives. And I'll start by reading a passage here um, about hitchhiking when I was younger and um, what, what life was like growing up around um, Coot Hill in County Cavan. And um, before I do that, I want to say hello to my cousin in Staffordshire uh, that has dialed in. I can't see your name other than your iPhone cousin, but uh, it might be Siobhan or Eamon. I'm not sure who it might be. Um, so I've got, like many Irish people, I've lots of relatives in England and also in the US and Australia. So the emigrant journey. And hello to uh, Amanda uh, connecting in in Gloucester, Gloucester in Massachusetts, the US. Uh, hello to Kimberly in Colorado. Anne-Marie in Boston. How's it going? Uh, who else have we got? Uh, a few other people here and there. I'll come back to them. So um, lots of Americans in the house. You're all uh, very welcome. And uh, Ackle Island, West Coast representing again. So we've got a bit of a, a community going on here that's spanning a few different countries. Um, so keep the comments going. And yes, it is my cousin Siobhan. How's it going? Um, okay, so I'll start this reading and apologies to anybody that has read the book or has heard these passages. You might be sick of me at this stage, but um, I'll try and mix it up or if you have any requests, um, fire them into the chat. So um, I'll do my best at this. Um, I was never great at reading at school. I was one of them lads that was down the back of the class. So how I've ended up um, reading books on Zoom, I do not know, but that's a whole other story. Um, so this this is at the start of the book. It says, one afternoon when I was 13 years old, I attracted the attention of some school bullies as I rode the bus home from school. The older guys sneakily tied the cords of my coat to the seat so that when I tried to get to stand up, I found myself stuck and I missed my stop. I was raging and it seemed as if everyone was laughing at me. Just what I needed on top of the vulnerability I already felt being new to the area. 
However, what was then a humiliating experience soon opened up the door to a new world of possibility. From that day on, with, a cautious, with the cautious blessing of my parents, hitching beca became my primary mode of school transport until my family eventually moved closer to town. But hitching was not only a means of avoiding confrontation with school bullies, and it wasn't just for fun or adventure. It was mainly a practical way of getting from one place to another. Back then, fewer people owned cars and public transport was scarce. Hitchhiking was a natural alternative in those quieter, slower, slower times when people weren't so weary of lending a hand. You might end up waiting a long time in the rain, but eventually you'd reach your destination. Community spirit was a prominent feature of life in decades past. In part, out of necessity, people either stuck together or they perished alone. Neighbours often helped each other through the mehel, the old Irish term for work sharing. My grandmother used to tell us stories about the neighbours who helped build her family's house. Offering the same kindness in return, my grand's family would pitch in with the farm work and the wheel of reciprocity and interdependence kept turning. Hitchhiking always felt to me like a natural part of the web, this web of interconnectedness. It exemplifies that sense that we're all in it together, that we can pick someone up when they need help, as it might be us or someone we know who needs help tomorrow. I experienced this each Saturday morning during my teens when I would hitchhike 24 kilometers from Coothill to Cavan to play rugby matches. I'd usually end up walking and waiting for half an hour or more before getting a lift and then the same on the way back, but I thought nothing of it. In an era before smartphones or the internet, it was as if I had all the time in the world. Does anyone remember the era before smartphones? <laughs> it's like, it feels like distant history at this stage. Um, and now here I am forgetting where I was. Um, yeah, in later years, hitchhiking opened up the world to me when I traveled in, I, I hitchhiked around Scotland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, West Africa. I gained insight into other people and cultures and developed confidence, conversational skills and a capacity for trust. Times changed though, as the years passed, hitching slowly disappeared from my life and seemingly from the world around me. The more money I earned, the lazier I became opting for comfort and convenience over the occasional hardship of thumbs out travel. As the Irish economy blossomed, people bought cars and public transport somewhat improved. Urbanization, individualism and the pressures of modern life also set in. And with these, hitchhiking faded into the past. The demise of hitching was aided by movies and news reports that pushed a particular narrative suggesting hitchhikers might be dangerous people or they themselves stood a good chance of being attacked by opportunistic drivers. I wasn't entirely immune to the fear factor. I understood that safety could be a concern, especially for women. My experience as a man could not compare, a sobering reminder that all is not equal and just in the world. I had encountered a few creepy drivers myself over the years, and while I managed to get away from them by trusting my gut and asking to be dropped off early, these kinds of experiences had left me more skeptical, cynical, and cautious than desired. Keeping an open heart was important to me, I always loved the line from the Edgar Guest poem, Faith, that reads, strangers are friends that we someday may meet. I'd seen, though, how easy it was to become closed off in order to protect myself. When I first told people of my plans to hitchhike around Ireland, common responses included, aren't you afraid of being murdered and nobody hitches anymore? Whether hitching was dead or not was a valid question and one I was keen to investigate. I didn't doubt that Dangers existed, but I, was all, I wasn't also convinced that people were now too busy, mistrustful or selfish to bother giving lifts. I like the idea of challenging conventional wisdom of putting my thumb out to the nation to see what it stood for. In doing so, I would be reconnecting with my youthful openness, healing old wounds and inviting my country to reveal itself. So that's the backstory. Um, Hello, Jim from Liverpool, the capital of Ireland. <laughs> Good man, Jim. <laughs> Fair play. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll do another reading in a minute. And um, if you have any questions, fire them in. And anyone who's just joined, you're more than welcome. And I'd love to know where you're joining from. And we'll be doing Q&A in a while. Um, yeah, just to share that, um, you know, this book came out in an interesting week in the planet of human history, or of the planet, of the, the history of humans, rather. Um, it came out the 26th of March, 
And it took me a long, long time to finish, to write the book. And then I had to rewrite it and then dismantle it and rewrite it again. Uh, it was my first time ever writing a book and I found it quite challenging, truth be told, but I learned a lot out of it. Uh, one of the biggest things I learned out of writing the book was perseverance and persistence and discipline and focus. You know, I have had that in my life before, but I'd also get enamored by new things and shiny things and the latest thing to the big campaign that needed attention, you know, whereas writing a book is slow, methodical work. And it taught me that, but it took me a few years and I gave myself a bit of a kicking around it. And eventually um, it came out with a US publisher called Chelsea Green Publishing that are based in Vermont. And it came out on, it was released, due for released on March 26th. And what happened a few days before March 26th? All the shops closed, the bookshops closed, the lockdowns, coronavirus. Um, so in a way you could say a disaster, but not really. Um, I had planned a tour around Ireland, uh, eight venues I was going to be going around to, and I was going to hitchhike to the venues. Um, so that was all cancelled. And then I was due to go to um, England and maybe Scotland, Wales in the summer and also the US. So obviously they ended up being cancelled. But like Niall and others listening and watching will know this well, particularly if you've anything to do with community uh, orientated stuff. You're just kind of used to adversity. You're used to things maybe not going the way they planned and you're used to doing things with no money or, or limited resources and you're used to thinking creatively ultimately so there's no point in sitting around and feeling sorry for yourself and licking your wounds you either just roll up the sleeves and get stuck back in or you cry yourself to sleep you know so I rolled up the sleeves and I had an online launch on zoom and you know even and I was talking to my wife Susan about it today even an hour before the launch I didn't know how to do live streaming on zoom and I was pressing buttons like good oh and stressing out max I was doing radio interviews and everything and stressing out but it was amazing I had two great Irish women uh senators uh Lynn Ruan and Francis Black two kind of citizen senators that we have here in Ireland uh, they were guest speakers and a renowned violinist musician friend of mine who features in the book called Colin McInumra. So it was a wonderful event. And since then I've done, I don't know, maybe a dozen. And I've essentially on a bit of a Zoom and online world tour. And um, we've ha we have regular events now in the US and upcoming events in Hungary, the Netherlands, uh, Australia, um, where else? London. Anyway, a few, a few other places and, oh, South Africa. And I just think this is amazing, you know, that, you know, here I am staying toasty in front of the fire, not having to pay for any flights or go anywhere. And I'm getting to travel around the world and, and connect with people. I just think it's fantastic. I know it's, we can argue that it's not ideal on one hand and it isn't but it's also brilliant in another way. So I'm taking a lot of positives out of that. And I'm also, um, I'm being very grateful for the opportunity and I'm grateful for your time and your ears and your support as well. I don't take any of that for granted. And there's one thing this pandemic is teaching me is, is gratitude, you know, and particularly the things that you miss like live music and gigs and going out and meeting friends and family, anything that you took for granted. I just, I find that, Gratitude is a great leveler and, you know, also just to have four walls and a roof over my head and food and warmth. And um, those are things that many people can't take for granted. I just heard of another homeless death in Dublin today and Ireland has a devastatingly high rate of homelessness. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to go on too much about that, but um, it, it is a theme in the book, I suppose. Um, it's this journey of like I'm navigating hitchhiking around Ireland, but I'm also navigating life and understanding life and meaning and what it means to be happy and content. And it's one of the things I found is that perspective and mindset and attitude, they're so fundamental to how we survive, regardless of what our circumstances might be. And I'm not seeking to diminish um, any pressure, stress, adversity that anybody is under because it's you know, you can philosophize till the cows come home and it doesn't sometimes make things easier. 
Um, so that's just, you know, some of what's going on for me at the moment. But it's, it is a, a curious time to be alive. And um, uh, just a quick hello to Amanda Nash, who is joining from, where are you joining from, Amanda? I'd be curious. And I wonder, um, are you related? Gloucester, Gloucester, Mass. Oh, Gloucester. How's it going? I didn't even know your mic was on, but that's good. It's no, good. I just turned it on when you asked me the question. Oh, okay, cool. I'm Thanks. Thanks. Often. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate it. Uh, so, um, I'll do, um, I will do another reading if that's okay. And, um, yeah, thanks. Bear with me. This is, um, it's, um, where am I? Okay. I'll do the one about the Irish language cause it's a little bit uncomfortable for me. So I might as well embarrass myself a little bit. Um, and that is, I start this trip by doing what all good Irish men do, visiting their mother and um, eating nutritious food and getting fortified for the road ahead. And um, my mother is originally from Donegal and we grew up in Cavan, as I said, but she then has her own story, which is an inspirational story in itself. Um, a few things um few things happened in her life that led her to make some changes and she ended up up in sticks and relocating and following her dream to move back to the seaside and she now lives in Spiddle in Connemara and so I was visiting her in Spiddle and I was down um I was in her car now this is before I started off hitching but it, it I just it's a short story anyway so it says after dinner that evening with my mother I parked her car near the beach in Spiddle, and as the clouds lifted over the shimmering dark blue waters of Galway Bay. As I set off on a walk, I noticed two older men trying to get their car started. I asked if they needed a push, and they replied in Irish with a phrase I didn't understand. The Irish language was never my strong point, but it seemed their English was just as bad. Ta brown orum, nil moran gilgagum, I stuttered back as best I could. I'm sorry. My Irish is poor. They replied again in Irish, but I was lost, humbled, humbled by my inability to communicate with these fellow Irishmen. We were only a few kilometers from Galway city and it was extremely rare to encounter non-Irish speakers, but this was a Gaeltacht area, an area where Irish was still the first language, at least for now. A sense of shame and embarrassment crept over me. I felt like a stranger in my own land. The men seemed relaxed, as though they were used to this kind of situation. No doubt, like many native Irish speakers, they had daily interactions with state agencies and others whom they couldn't really understand. Several native spe speakers I know had told me that the difficulty of communicating with government services in Irish, and it was contributing to the decline of the language. I knew this was more than a loss of words and sounds. It was about the way different cultures perceive and experience the world. Even small everyday phrases like hello, geogich in Irish, tell us something about the difference in depth in the depth of the Irish language. Geogich or God be with you is a greeting imbued with a sense of reverence and blessing that goes beyond religion. I eventually managed to communicate with the men through eye contact and hand gestures. We all smiled and I joined one of them to give the car a push start. Slán, I shouted as they sped off, leaving me deep in thought. I have an Irish name, Ruri, from Rua, meaning red, and Ri, meaning king, and my encounter with the men had reminded me that I was missing a deeper connection to the language of my ancestors and to different ways of seeing and being. I hadn't expected my brief stay in Spiddle, or on Spigel, as it's called, to awaken such powerful reflections, but it felt fitting. I was about to embark on a journey, not only with an eye to Ireland's future, but also to reconnect with my nation's history and tradition. So, um, so J Jim is asking, uh, where about in Donegal in the Gaeltacht? Oh yeah, um, Jim, you're asking about my mother. Um, no, she's not actually from the Gaeltacht. She's from um, Bundoran, which is um, sometimes jokingly known as Fundoran because it's a seaside fun location. And um, actually, one book, a, a guy wrote a review of my book in a national paper and 
he took the mickey out of that section and it i i <laughs> i'm trying not to be mad with him but i'd love to have words with him someday about slagging off that section about bundoran but anyway you have to take the rough with the smooth you know and um it's a funny thing putting out a book as well and um, you're kind of putting yourself out there and you know you're open to criticism and there's obviously going to be people that don't like it as sure as night is day and i compare it to putting out music tell me someone that loves jazz music loves classical music also loves blues and folk all equally now they do exist but you know people have different tastes and preferences and not everyone needs to like everything and then also with food like if you don't you know some people like mexican some people like thai then there's people like me that probably like all of it as well but you know i've just been thinking a lot about that it's it's criticism is part of life and you have to kind of take it in the chin but also sometimes you need to learn from it and sometimes it's valid that um maybe the writing is a bit crap here or there or you know you can improve and so i'm open to that as well but that has been part of this journey in in writing the book and put or rather publishing the book uh see barbara is commenting that bundorn is the surf capital of the world that's thereabouts i'm i'm here in lehinch and the lehinch people would tell you lehinch is the surf capital of the world so anyway uh surfing uh how are we doing for time yeah so maybe i'll read one more passage and then um, then maybe we'll do some questions if anyone has any questions um i'm gonna jump forward into um Done, Tim. Let me see if Tim. I'll give Tim a go. Um, ninety-five. So Tim, uh, the, Tim nearly killed me actually. Um, he, um, I was hitching to the side of the road actually outside Donegal Town on the way to Letterkenny, and um, Tim stopped for me, but he nearly fucking drove over me as he pulled over the car. <laughs> so I remember that well. Um. So this bit starts, um, and it's further on in the book. It's like, it's a good halfway through anyway. Um, so it starts with, they say the teacher appears when the student is ready. And I was prepared for Tim, who had announced his revival, or not his revival, who had announced his arrival in a blaze of glory. I'd been hitching on the road to Letterkenny no more than three minutes when a small red car almost swayed off the road to offer me a lift. Ah, you're on the hero's journey, said Tim a sociology lecturer and former priest who was on his way to a recovery meeting in Letterkenny. The hitching, it's, obviously, it's obvious you heard the call to adventure and answered it. That's how you go about finding the gold, he said, comparing the trip to the hero's journey, a template downloaded by mythologist Joseph Campbell. Campbell proposed that most of the world's cultures and religions have a common myth reflected in everything from the heroes of Irish legend to Greek mythology. It's a tale that has been told a thousand times. More recently in Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, The Hunger Games and beyond. It's a story of an individual called or pushed into an adventure, often reluctantly, and then finds the courage to proceed while facing down foes and being helped by allies. Eventually the hero conquers some kind of dragon and returns home with gold. The goal being wisdom. I wasn't sure how well my trip fitted in with the hero's journey, though I could certainly say I had felt the call to action. Furthermore, I was meeting heroes all around me, people like Tim who demonstrated tremendous resilience and strove to live life to the fullest. Tim went on to describe his years as a priest, his challenges around addiction and his thoughts on living a good life. We're all here for a reason, to find a true calling that life is calling us to. We're better able to serve others when we're fulfilling our own meaning at the same time. I asked him what this meant for his own life. I could be sitting in a university teaching back in the United States, but I chose to be. I chose not to be because I wasn't happy there and I felt I wasn't true to myself. I have found in my own spiritual journey that if I don't look into myself and answer my own questions, then I'm in no place to be able to be of service to others. We all have within us this desire to be a success and achieve our best in life, but of course, it's not just a physical best. It's also a spiritual best. We're meant for something great. 
In my own recovery from alcoholism, I see that the quote from the Psalms, come to me all who thirst. When I was, when I was drinking, I was trying to fulfill something that could never be fulfilled with alcohol. I think it's a desire for something deeper that we often only get later in life. There's a book out now by a man by the name of Richard Rohr, Immortal Diamond it's called. He's talking about that part of us within, that divine part that can only be fulfilled through getting to know our spiritual selves. So that's Tim, the former priest. And then um, I actually got lifted by a priest later on. I met a young woman that I knew from a previous life who, um, who was actually about to become a nun. And then I meet people that are angry with the church around abuse and cover-ups and injustice, uh, people that are secular, don't believe in religion, other people that are more into uh, spirituality through meditation or other forms of uh, whether it be Buddhism or whatever. So that's one of the themes amongst many. And um, But, you know, as I said earlier, that one of the overarching themes is, is the religion of kindness. Uh, that doesn't require anybody to sign up to, to any religion. And the kindness that I experienced on this trip was second to none in, in so much that I set off with no money, no plan, no agenda, no idea who I'd meet, where I would go, where I would stay. And I was gifted every day and every moment, not just lifts, but stories, um, food, places to stay, uh, also people chipped in money to help me cover some basic costs and then people started sharing and supporting the trip on social media and so it became this thing where I ended up on radio on tv and hitching for hope became this kind of national moment not not you know it, it was big it wasn't the biggest thing in the country or anything but um it just for me showed what's possible when you just follow a little idea and sometimes what can be seem like a mad idea you know um, sometimes the mad ideas are the best, not always, but sometimes. And here I am years later talking to you in Colorado, uh, Massachusetts, Liverpool, uh, Ackle Island, all over the world, just because of this mad idea. And you're going to maybe pick up an idea or some angle of something maybe I said or somebody else I'm quoting, and that might then inform your life. Or you might go off this call in the next half hour and tell somebody else something. And I believe that that's sort of like a beautiful magic and mystery to life, how those interconnections take place, how stories are weaved together and intermingled. And I also believe that that's a powerful force for change in how we can change the world by sharing the stories, particularly stories that uplift and empower us. So there are plenty of stories in this book uh, of injustice of people that um, lost businesses, lost relationships, people that had wrongs done by them. I met a woman who lost someone due to a hit and run accident. Um, and there's talk about, you know, the political injustices and so on. But within all of that, um, a dominant thread is and was uh, resilience and courage where people just held it together and forged ahead and for me that's so vital in this moment that we're in now that we don't waver you know we don't we don't bend or fold or lose our dreams uh, and that we keep um, I think idealism can be a dangerous thing at times particularly if it leads to fanaticism uh, but I also think it can be a wonderful thing where we have imagination to imagine the possible, imagine what's possible from the collapse of what might be happening in the world right now and what can a new world look like? What, what, can, we, what can we do better? And my view is that before COVID or coronavirus or any of that, before all of that, things were not going well. Um, and you can argue that on a number of levels, social, political, cultural, but the one I would really emphasize is ecological. And 99.9% .9 of the world's top scientists and pretty much everyone else at this point has a general consensus around ecological and ecosystem collapse. 
which of which we're part of. You know, it's where our food comes from. It's where our shelter comes from. It's where our water comes from. It's where our life, health and well-being depend on the health of the planet. So even if you're, you know, an uber capitalist, um, there's still an interest in the health of the planet because it's about sustainability and viability and having enough resources to keep all of us well, but also future generations. It's not just about us. So I'd like to think there's a moment and an opportunity here. I don't know what it's going to look like. I think that's up to kind of co-creation. That's up to you, your organizations, your campaigns. People have different thoughts, ideas, angles on it. I'm not going to preach any one view on it. Uh, I just want to feel say that I feel that we have a moment here and it can be a positive one. So um, I'll take one question and I might bring uh, Niall onto the screen if he has any questions as well. And um, just somebody's asking me, how many people currently speak Irish language? Are there schools that focus on the language? So yes, uh, the first question is, I'm not gonna be able to give you an accurate answer, but it might be something like 300,000 people may speak it on a daily basis. In the Gaeltacht regions, I'm gonna say maybe 30,000 people, but there are massive urban Irish Gaeltacht language regions in particularly in West Belfast, which is really the, one of the more intriguing ones. And I do write about this in the book and I also write about a Gaeltacht in Derry City. Um, I'm excited by those, but it's also declining as well as growing. There's a revival. We all learn it at school. Um, Jim's remind me there's seven Gale talks. You're absolutely correct. There's Cork, Mead, Donegal. Uh, there's a tiny bit in Clare. Um, there's Galway, Mayo. I might be missing some, but Jim will catch me on that, no doubt. <laughs> um, um, I, I have a helper in the background saying 74,000 people speak it daily. So, um, And the other thing is we do learn it at school, but it's taught, in, often taught, I shouldn't say always, but often taught in a very post-colonial way whereby colonization taught many of us that the Irish language is a bad thing. It was a regressive thing. And this is common with a lot of cultural colonialization historically that many people are taught to believe that their native culture is, is something to be left in the past. So there's some of that has lingered, but it's, it is changing for the positive, I would say, uh, but a lot of work to be done. Uh, and somebody's saying there's Gail Tuckton Waterford, you're right, uh, on Rin, Ring in Waterford and Kingston, Ontario, Canada. And I would also add in Prince Edward Island in Canada has a little Scots Gaelic uh, one as well. Anyway, we could go on about this for a while, but uh, I'll bring Niall back into the mix here if you have any questions. And anybody tuning in, uh, you're more than welcome to chip in any questions at this point. And apologies if I don't get your questions. And I also want to say a big thanks to, to you all for your time. And if you do have to log out early, we've only 15 more minutes, but you can find the book as paperback, audiobook, and ebook and all the main bookseller websites. I try and encourage people to support the local small independent shops. And all the links are at uh, hitchingforhope.com, hitchingforhope.com. I'll be quiet now for a while. Thanks, Niall. Um, so how did hitchhiking become a big part of your life to begin with? When did you first go hitchhiking and did your parents trust you? Um, were they, they okay with that? Yeah, so, so that was that kind of story about the bullying at school. And yeah, it was around the age, I think it was around the age of 13, which... Yeah, look, we can look at the age of 13 as it's a child, you're very vulnerable. Um, but it's also like, in, in a way, the start of adulthood, you know, and adolescence. And um, But I also lived in a very small community. It was fairly safe. People knew each other. I don't want to overly romanticize it and pretend that Ireland was all safe all the time for everyone. It wasn't. Um, but I've always had great parents that thankfully kind of entertain me and let me off to what I did you know so even yeah. when I was I traveled a lot as a teenager and then when I was 17 I went traveling all around Europe by train and since then I've traveled loads so traveling for me has been a, a vital instrument for education ultimately and I'm sad that people can't travel now I think it's a good thing for the planet perhaps but also all those young people that aren't getting a chance to travel and broaden their horizons so um, 
you know, but hitchhiking was a great thing for me growing up because it also get it teaches you how to have conversations with strangers and, you know, teaches you listening as well because the, the driver is the boss. What <laughs> they dictate the rules of the engagement in a way. You can't dominate the conversation, so you have to kind of follow their lead a little bit. So it's an interesting uh, way of um, learning about life, you know. It's fantastic. Um, so do you think, in a way, that, of course, it's difficult because it might have been more difficult to sell copies of the book during the crisis, but do you also think it's fitting that it came out during this crisis at the start, obviously, with it being about hope? and Yeah, I mean, you probably know that term, divine timing, you know? It's like, I don't know, the world works in mysterious ways. Who knows? Like maybe it was perfect. On one level, it was, you know, wasn't ideal. Shops are closed <laughs> for three months, and uh, nightmare. They've actually been closed for the last six weeks here as well. Uh, now people can order online, but a lot of people don't, and I probably have lost a lot of potential sales. But there's nothing I can do about that. And. Um, maybe you'll all go out and buy hundreds of copies. <laughs> I don't know. Um, who knows? Who knows? Uh, you just have to take it as it rolls. And, and it's also, I kind of think these things, it's not over till the fat lady sings, as the saying goes. Like, you know, I'm going to keep promoting the book till maybe next March, and that will be 12 months. But I have to be honest and say, I'm getting a bit, I don't know, you know, all the social media and everything. Yeah, I have to promote these events and, and make sure people know about them. Yeah. You do get a bit tired self-promoting. You want to um, meet people? And, yeah, 100%. Yeah, well, I want to meet people in person, but I'm also, and, and people on my social media, they're probably sick of me as well. So sorry if you're one of those, because um, I'm promoting, promoting, promoting. But you got to do what you got to do, so. Niall? Um, James. Hi, 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 Rory. Hi, Niall. Hi, hi everyone else. Um, just a, a quick question. I, I've done a fair bit of hitching and I've picked up quite a number of um, hitchhikers during the course of my few years. Um, but most of the conversations I have are fairly banal. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you, you appear to be able to get into a certain depth with these people, which I certainly can't. Ah. Uh. You can come to my Hitchhiking Academy, Jim. <laughs> it's an online course in hitching. No, I don't know. I have, it's the first time I've said this out loud, but I have come to realize recently, uh, people have said it to me that I probably have a little bit of a knack for um, getting people to open up. I'm not trying to make them do it, but some of it's just about... Uh, listening and then finding the cues or the pauses like if they mention you know you know Irish people do it you know through like where are you from where did you grow up and then you find this clue of like oh your granny's from Mayo oh did you ever go to there and then before you know it you kind of you know that you've met her uncle last week and you were playing <laughs> I don't know so it's finding all those cues but then the one thing I find about opening up then as well is the vulnerability aspect of someone sharing what's what's personal to them. I think um, a lot of people are lonely and perhaps a lot of people driving, uh, particularly if they're like driving for a living, uh, don't maybe have someone to talk to all day and they maybe want to, to chat. But I find that also if you share something about yourself and something that might be a little bit vulnerable, that creates permission for someone else to open up if they feel inclined. I would never try and force anyone to do that. But, you know, if I tell you, like, I'm having a really hard time during the coronavirus pandemic and I'm feeling lonely and all the rest. Now, as it happens, I'm doing all right, thank God. But it, I just feel it creates permission there. But you have to allow the spaces then, because if you force the conversation forward too fast, um, you skip the beats and people will end up talking about what's on TV and did you see the match? And those things are all relevant, but the more meaningful, important conversations are the ones that really matter to me. And again, I would say that they should never be forced, but I do have a podcast called the love and courage podcast. And I, I get to chat to people on that and they, they, they just tell me their lives and it's, it's an amazing privilege. 
it really is. Um, but yeah, you, like Jim, you know, there probably are people that were weren't. Uh, there, there definitely have been people that didn't speak to me, and I just can't remember them. <laughs> so <laughs> they they faded from my memory. Um, someone's asking, where am I on social media? Um, oh, Jesus. Um, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. I'll put the links in the chat in a minute. Um, I'm not on TikTok because I'm getting too old and I don't even know what it is, barely. Uh, it's hard to keep up. And someone else asked me a question. Um, I'm just taking a note of it here. Uh, what was the thing you learned most from hitching that you didn't already realize? Um, I think, you know, one of the big things in life in general and hitching really teaches you this, but I didn't fully understand it at the time until later is letting go and trusting, you know, sometimes you want to be fully in control of life and where we're going and what, gonna, what we're going to be doing next month, next year. And life has other plans and hitching kind of teaches you to let go and just trust the road a bit and trust you're going to be all right and you're going to get a lift and you're going to end up wherever you need to end up. Um, you know, I don't want to overly simplify that, but um, I think trusting the unknown is a big thing. So I hope that partially answers that question. Um, Sina said iPhone, put the hands up, maybe. Is that, is that a question? Uh, I think that might be a question, yeah. Uh, if you want to put it into the chat or speak on the on the chat, speak. You're you're more than welcome. And um, I'll just comment. Someone mentioned uh, I got a, a message saying uh, the power of one making yourself vulnerable to the other, with patient listening, slowing down, and and that's from Joan in Canada. You're spot on. Thanks, Joan. And um, somebody is mentioning con con shocken. Sorry, I'm not even pronouncing an Irish word right. Con. Concho Hocken, Concho Hocken, just outside Philadelphia. Uh, we have a great Irish center here that offers Gaelic. Jeez, fair play. That's from Kathy Ward. And I think I'll be doing an event in Philadelphia very soon as well. And apologies for butchering the name of an Irish name in the US. Disaster. Um, any other comments there? Hello, someone's mentioning. Uh, oh, yeah, the Ontario Gael talked. So, uh, Niall, do you have any other? Um, so you mentioned that you were obviously you went hitchhiking because you were so um, close to leaving Ireland. So how close was you to leaving Ireland, and how happy are you that you've stayed? Uh, yeah, I, wa I wasn't like super super close, but it was starting to become a prospect and a thought in my mind. Going there, there's so much um, political ineptitude here, and still is. Um, yeah, our housing system is a disaster. It's very hard for hundreds of thousands of people to afford a home to rent or to buy. Uh, that's true in much of the Western world. Uh, but housing is such a fundamental thing in, in one's well-being. And then our health system is atrocious. It's truly atrocious. Now, that's not to take away from the courage and integrity and professionalism of the health system staff who are absolute heroes. But I do think some of that's going on with the NHS in the UK, the kind of dismantling of it and diminishing it. So health and housing, fundamental to a good society, in my view. And then a lot of kind of cover ups and corruption and cronyism, again, common to many other countries as well. But um, a lot of that would just do your head in and you just feel like I'm a better off building a life in another country. And a lot of people have felt that and experienced that. Um, but I do feel it's important. Um, I don't judge anyone that's ever emigrated for any reason, but I do think it's important to stay and to build and be part of the change. And there's no point in just giving out about politicians all the time and giving out about the government. Like we, we have to be the government and we have to create the change we want to see in our countries. And we ultimately are the country, you know? So it's like claim, the, claim our rights and claim our power. And it's back to that people power aspect again. Can you just, maybe just like a, a little minute, you said that you was a hitchhiking around West Africa. I just wondered, yeah. just wondered about that. What, what was that oh, like? Oh, that was a weird one. Um, uh, that was, um, well, I went to university in, um, in outside Glasgow in a place called Paisley. Uh, I actually tried to go to university in Liverpool and yeah. I didn't get in. So Did uh, you? I never forgiven you. Like, thanks. Uh, so much. 
Uh, but I <laughs> try finally, again. I finally met on to Liverpool Zoom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, the moral of this story is um, I um, went to university there and I had a, I think it was a summer break or something. And I wanted to fly off somewhere uh, different, but I didn't have much money. And I, I went onto this like lastminute.com or whatever it was at the time. Oh no, I phoned a travel agent. That's what I did. And I said, where can I go? Like, that's really cheap. Anyway, they said, you can go to Gambia in West Africa for 60 quid if you, if you leave tomorrow from Manchester. And I said, oh, dead. <laughs> bring it on so i got a train down to manchester and i flew off to the gambia in west africa and i ended up doing a little bit of hitchhiking there and uh, that was mental it was brilliant it's very spontaneous yeah yeah <laughs> that's mad um would you be writing any further books in the future in your future can you see yourself maybe taking a year or two and then start <laughs> with a new topic or yeah well yeah, it's a hot, it's a big topic right now. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm kind of a bit nervous now telling you this a little bit here, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so we have a lockdown here that started five weeks ago. And it, at the time it was announced, it was pretty much the most uh, stringent, severe lockdown in Europe. Now things have changed yeah, yeah. all the time in different countries, but like, it's not that bad for us where we are. We live in a small rural place, so life is pretty mellow you know there's not loads of police everywhere and it's not loads of people everywhere so and there's not much going on in the winter anyway but so this lockdown happened anyway but i was like well first of all geez i'm no good at short answers am i um okay <laughs> after this book i said i'm never going to write another book for maybe not for years because it was so so hard and took so much time thousands and thousands of hours and then to launch it and promote it thousands and thousands of hours and Meanwhile, you have to try and make a living and you're doing all this and you have to go, well, what? Jesus, there has to be an easier way of doing things in the world. But I have to say, I've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot out of it, but I didn't want to race back into it. Um, and then the lockdown happened. And on day one, I went, you know what? This is a, such a historic moment in time mm -hmm. on our planet. Like when, when people look back in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, they'd be like, that was Bananarama you know like look what was going on on the planet at that time and then you have trump in the middle of it going rah, like i won't even go there but like just pure madness flying around the place and e ecologically economically you name it so i just want this is fascinating um and it's difficult and there are a lot of positives that people i've met are finding in it as well more time with their family you know, less time commuting. So it's a mixed bag for different people. Um, and I just thought I want to do something creatively to try and capture this moment. And I came up with a few project ideas. And then before I knew it, I started writing. And next thing, all these words were just flying onto the page. And so for the last five weeks, I've been writing every day. And I start to realize that probably what's happening is I'm writing a book that is a diary of the lockdown pandemic. And I started on day one of a lockdown. I'm going to finish on the last day of the lockdown. So next Wednesday, I will have finished the second book, which is like mind boggling to me to even say that. And I don't know if you'll ever get to read that book because I can't promise you that it's any good. Uh, I hope that it is. I hopefully it'll travel on its own. But like the hitchhiking thing, I've let go. If it's meant to get out there, it'll get out there. And maybe we'll end up doing another event about that. But it's been a lovely project because I've got to like process a lot of my thoughts. And it's kept me in a good mood, to be honest, because I've, I haven't got caught up in thinking too much. I'm putting all my thoughts down onto paper. So it's been therapeutic. And a lot of people would say that about writing. So it's been very enjoyable. So the last book took me six years to write and this one took me six weeks. There you go. Hopefully all goes well in the next seven weeks, seven days and I keep writing and please God. So we'll see. Yeah, it's a crazy time. So it does feel like it would be a good time to, to put your thoughts onto paper, definitely. So well, yeah. fair play. Yeah. 
I think um, we all we all should be putting our thoughts onto paper right now, isn't it? Like yeah. Everyone, it's crazy. Well, you know, the arts are really important, and you'll know that from the Irish Centre in Liverpool. There, like music and poetry and writing and theatre, mm. they're so fundamental to people. And and like obviously, you can do a lot of it through Zoom and the internet, but there's nothing that beats the power of the arts to bring people together to process some of the emotions that we're feeling. We might want to talk or put things into words. We just want to like headbang or like dance or you know have the crack whatever so i'm i'm big up on like we need to really support the arts as well because a lot of artists are have their livelihoods robbed from them at the moment and um so i think we need to do more in that regard and um i'll give a plug out now to my my lovely wife is actually near me here but uh she's actually a musician her name is susan quirk and you'll find her on youtube actually i'll put her website into the chat box there for the crack um so she's a musician and she's also a meditation teacher and she teaches meditation online which is not something that she did prior to the pandemic and she teaches weekly courses which is amazing to people all over the world and she has an album coming out next year which is pretty cool and um, I'm going to put in my social media links into the chat now as well. In this is for people on Zoom. Um, and then, oh Jesus, what else? I've the Love and Courage podcast. If you're into podcasts, and then uh, I'm promoting all my stuff now. Hitchingforhope.com is where you find the book, or in all the different websites and booksellers. And uh, and yeah, so. I think we're there about, so unless anyone has any other things they want to ask. Um, yeah, we'd, we'd um, love to have you in the Irish Centre. You could uh, read from your books. You could do some songs. Cool. Be a nice event. Yeah, thanks very much. That would be cool. Um, so do you want to name the date? or? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens with coronavirus, but uh, yeah, when people can meet up again legally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Big time. <laughs> um oh my god i'm i need a comment here from my cousin siobhan who is in staffordshire and my uncle matty or matthew mckiernan was a member of the liverpool irish center we had many good times there shame it's closed uh so we lost matty uh just a few months ago and uh so it feels appropriate to um I'm getting emotional now, but to honor him, he um, he's from Cavan Town and he emigrated to Stafford when he was quite young. And uh, he's he raised a, him and his wife, Mary, raised an amazing family there. And I know that kids were devastated uh, to lose him a few months ago, which is a particularly hard time for anyone, you know, these days. And um, it just feels like I'm stunned right now just to find out that he, he actually was part of the the Liverpool Irish Centre and he was a big part of the Brit Irish in England, Irish in Britain and a great advocate and community man as well. And uh, it's good to honour him. So thanks, Vaughn, for letting me know that. And uh, that, that feels very special. So it feels like he's in the Zoom room with me now. Um, OK, so um, Thanks to all the friends in the US and Massachusetts in particular, but Colorado and other, someone's saying uh, they used to visit Liz Canner, Vaughan's Pub, McHugh's, Doolan to List in Varna. Yeah, lots of good vibes around these parts. So come visit County Clare when you can. Uh, and um, someone's saying the original Irish Centre closed in 1990. The new one in West Derby is the current one. Well, it's all good by me, new and old together. And um, yeah, uh, big respect to all those uh, keeping the flame alive for the so-called diaspora and the Irish abroad and Irish culture and heritage. It's a big part, like the Irish global family, if you like. Ireland extends way beyond this island. And it's great to even, you know, meet your, yourself, Niall. Uh, we never met before. Great, great Irish name, Scouser accent. It's all good by me. So... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so thanks to everyone for um joining in this evening and or whatever time zone you're in uh, kimberly in the us and everyone else um it's it's been fantastic and um hopefully we'll get to to do it again in in person or somewhere else so we'll see um 
so yeah i'm always i'm always find it hard to to finish these events um uh yeah anyway we'll just have to finish thanks, <laughs> somebody, thanks, somebody thanks press so uh, the off switch thanks so much Rory. that was uh, fantastic thanks thanks so much yeah thanks again Niall. thanks to everybody and uh please uh check out the book hitching for hope um and um i have some signed copies as well if you want to order them straight from my website it's hitchingforhope.com and um that's all the self-promoting done and best of luck to everyone mind yourselves look after yourselves i'm going to be pulling the off switch now take care <laughs> bye bye <laughs>